weary land where many a dream has died. Like a tree planted by the water, we never will run high. about uh, Jeff and Chani, if we could, oh, we got the pictures going already, good. So Jeff and Chani, uh, we met them when we were in Cambodia, and they live in a uh, town called Barambang, and uh, they have a sports ministry that they started. In Cambodia, uh, one of the uh, sports that they really enjoy is uh, football, or soccer, and uh, lots of boys are into the football. So. Jeff, he decided to start a Christian sports ministry and reach out to these uh, youth. Um, now, he also decided to include uh, girls in it, 
And uh, they named the girls side, which is about 20 girls, they named that the Mighty Girls program. And he, he told me here, he says, uh, his Mighty Girls, they started as an outreach ministry so that the girls could be included into the sports programs. Today it has become so much more. Mighty Girls is a program that carefully accepts teenage girls from impoverished villages who are the most at risk of being sold by their parents into sex slavery. Um, I remember when Janet and I were there, we had another missionary friend, and they were ministering to some people, and they wanted a new motorcycle. So they decided to sell their daughter to the brothel so they get the motorcycle. Um, so now the girls on the uh, in My Girls program, they're not in that, but they're just very poor. And that's where people like to take advantage of people who are you know poor. So that's the Mighty Girls, and then he has the uh, Mighty Boys or Mighty Men program, and that's another 20 guys. And uh, this last one here, um, they, they do uh, outreach to the homes of the Mighty Girls and the Mighty Men, meet with their families, and uh, try to get them to understand who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he was able to also network with a lot of the uh, public schools who like to do soccer as well. And... They call that SALT. So this is the network that he's created of the public schools sports teams, and he is allowed to share the gospel with all of them. Wow. So, so I, I asked uh, Jeff, I said, could you please put a video together for me? And he says, I'm, I will do that as soon as possible. I am in the airport right now. We're stepping on the plane. So they came back to Oregon, they arrived, they were just visiting for, I'm not sure how long, maybe a month or a few months or something like that, and then they're headed back. But uh, he and Chani quickly put together a video for you, and if you could play the video. Hello, Four Seasons Church. We are Jeff and Jenny Rasmussen, serving God in Cambodia. We've just arrived to the States, beautiful States. Hi, we're so excited for our time to be here. We, um, yeah, it was it was quite difficult to leave Cambodia and come back because we have, you know, the Mighty Men and the Mighty Girl programs, and right now the Mighty Girls, the 20 girls, they are just flourishing in their program, and it's really encouraging and really rewarding to work with them. On the flip side, our 20 rebellious teenage boys are in a difficult season right now. Um, and it was requiring a lot of TLC to be caring for them and loving with them. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we are at with our ministry. What can they be praying for us about? Yeah, we would like uh, for you guys to pray for us that this time we will uh, have time to have a counseling and do a debrief so we can have strength to come back home to Cambodia because of we are working with uh, 40 trauma young people and it's cost us uh, also, so we want to have uh, the refresh and then when we go back, so we have strength to work with them. Yes, thank you so much for partnering with us and praying for us. Okay, so the prayer request I heard was we're worn out, please pray for our strength so we can get back in there, okay? So if we could all break up into groups and pray for their strength and uh, get in back on the saddle. All right, well, I want to remind you that we are into our uh, summer Wednesday night series with David, Dr. David Jeremiah. He's not here personally, but yeah, isn't it great? It's really good. It's called A Life Beyond Amazing, and we are learning about all kinds of neat things about joy, and it's really fabulous. So I encourage you to make way in your schedule and Give us a couple hours and you will be blessed. So every Wednesday night at 6.45 p.m., um, move and you can come in any time. You won't, you know, it's not something that won't make sense if you come in week four or something like that. So just come and enjoy. All right, also, just to not, another reminder, of our one hour of prayer every other Saturday from 11 to 12. We met yesterday and we had a mighty time of prayer. And the next one on the calendar two weeks from yesterday is July 2nd. So please join us for that. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, Chad was up here uh, with a wonderful program in case any of you missed it. We are um, 
getting our Christmas shopping done uh, way ahead of time, which is good for missionaries and uh, blessing missionaries that are doing all this hard work and they deserve a, a special treat. So if you missed that and would like to sign up to um, purchase a gift for one of the missionaries on our list, please see Ted afterwards. Or if you've already signed up and yeah, you need to meet with Ted to figure out what gift you're going to get. So anyway, we're excited. It's really a fun and just an incredible thing. So, all right. And um, our Saints Taking Action for our Nation's Destiny stand. Uh, we have a day on the calendar for our next meeting, and we pushed it to July 22nd. And that's a Friday night at 6.30. So you got a little preparatory time there to put it on your calendar. And we need to be informed about what's going on in our city, our state, our country, and stand up for biblical, our biblical rights and biblical, the way we want to serve God and live in accordingly. So please come and get informed. And Pastor Bill is going to make an announcement regarding solicit solicitations for money in that church. Yes. If uh, in this church, if anybody approaches you and asks for money, uh, please do us a favor. Do not give it to them. Uh, we have a policy here where we don't give cash out. We found that this is the wise thing to do. If, if you do see somebody in need, somebody asks you, just come forward and speak to me or speak to one of the board members. And, uh, and then we can determine whether it's a legitimate need and whether the church can help them. But uh, we don't want people soliciting. Asking for money in here is not good, especially for first-time visitors to come into a small church and uh, the uh, kind of uh, you know approach like that. So uh, that's our, our standard here. Also, uh, you see the baby bottles up there. This is kind of the last day for our uh, campaign for the Women's Resource Medical Center where we're making donations. We started Mother's Day. You can fill, fill up a baby bottle with a check or cash. If, if you left your baby bottle at home, Bring it in. If it's late, we'll, we'll, we'll still receive them, but we want to, we're going to turn those in uh, shortly to the Women's Resource Medical Center. They help uh, women keep their babies and uh, encourage them in various ways to, uh, to make that vote for life. Yeah. So it's time. Hey, Sheila, could you do me a favor? I'm going to need a drum roll here because we're going to announce the Father of the Year. And Stephanie, if you want to come forward, we have the envelope here, which has been kept. In, a, in this hermetically sealed envelope in our safe in the back and if you open that up and our father actually we have a tie this year Ing Marnus, between his siblings, uh, children, uh, and Ted McCreary. today's offering, um, I just want to remind you guys that the best $10 I ever spent was $10 on the Daily Walk Bible, and it just kind of gives you your little bit that you read every day, and I'm reading parts of the Bible that I would never have read before, Chronicles, Numbers, all the dry stuff that you fall asleep while you're reading it, but it explains to you why it's in there, why God put the genealogies in there, why the Book of Numbers is there why all the really strange feasts and all the rules, the strange rules that we have trouble uh, understanding in Leviticus. And then I do know this, your Bible reading is successive. 
the first time you get through the Bible, you, you learn a lot. The second time, you learn more. It's like God builds on the foundation. And I know about the feast that God wants you to bring these things to remembrance. That's what all the feasts are about, is to remember what God did. The Passover is to remember what he did, that he saved everyone who believed and put the blood on the posts. So just for those of us that have trouble reading the Bible, I'm like the number one nerd when it comes to actually reading the Bible. But I can see that God is blessing my life. He's changing my understanding. There's things that I used to believe that I don't believe anymore because it's not in the Word. And so I just want to thank God that He's given us His Word because it's a lamp unto our feet. Speaking of His Word, just real quick, because I have to be short and sweet up here, I'm going to read Psalm 113. Dear Heavenly Father, please bless the reading of Your Word today and may it reach somebody here that really needs You, Lord. Thank You, Jesus. Psalm 113. Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who dwelleth on high? Who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's bow our hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, so thankful that we have a church like this with a pastor and his wife who accepts us for who we are, Lord, as imperfect as that might be. Thank you that you extend your grace to us, Lord, and that there is forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, for all who turn to you. All manner of sin will be forgiven, Lord. We thank you for that. Accept blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask today that you bless either the little amounts we can give or the great amounts. The bottom line, that it make it to the people that need to hear about Jesus. We pray. And the young couple that Ted was introducing us to, we, we lift them up to you, Lord. We pray that you multiply the works of their hands and that the blessings, many, many souls, be saved. And protect those children, Father, from the predators that are all around. The enemy is real. Evil is real. And Lord, we, we thank you that we have protection in your Holy Spirit. We lift you up today. We thank you that you're blessing the, what we give today, Lord. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name, amen. amen. Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer the way he modeled for us in Scripture. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to talk today, God, again, about launching out into the, into the deep to uh, receive a haul. And we began talking about the Holy Spirit, and I found this wonderful choir uh, that sings about the Holy Spirit this morning and get our hearts ready for the message. So, Ron, if you're ready.
Lord, we need the Holy Ghost to come on down. That's right. Lord, we need the Holy Ghost to come on down. Lord, we need the Holy Ghost to come on down. Nobody sings like black choirs. I'm sorry, white folks. I think I saw one white face in there, so you know, there's always an exception. When I first came to town, I went to... Uh, I told you other times I went to Trinity Life Center and uh, uh, an Assembly of God Church, and it was very white bread. I mean, every you know, all the ladies that got their whippy doos, uh, their hair done on like Saturday, and uh, helmet hair, you know, and in the hair. Everybody looked like Norma Zimmer, you know. And um, so I was in and out of that that church over the years, and. Then the Lord led me back there in the 90s, and they had a Hispanic pastor then, and they, it, it was now a, an inner city kind of church. They had uh, a mix of, of uh, blacks, whites, and Hispanics, and man, they had a choir like that thing. Like, oh, whoa, yeah. Just something. Thank God. God loves variety, you know. So we're going to talk about, again, launching out into the deep. And uh, last week we saw how. Jesus had said to Peter, who had been fishing all night, if you remember, and they had already washed their nets. They were done. They were done fishing for the night because they caught nothing done. And Jesus says this in Luke chapter five, verse four. And this is in the World English Bible. I don't know if that'll come up the same way, but it, he said, "Push out into the deep water and let down your nets for a haul." And most translations will say for a catch, but that does not speak to me like a haul. A haul. And it made no sense to Peter, you know. And Peter was very honest. He said back to Jesus, hey, we, we've, I'm a professional fisherman. I've been out doing this all night. That's when we fish. That's when they, the fish gather. When we, you know, they, and, uh, you know, we've already cleaned the nets. But because you say so, we'll go out. So they launch out into the deep and they let down their nets. And they have so many fish that they have to call another fishing boat to come and help them. And with that other fishing boat and the other crew, they bring up all these fish, so many that when they bring the fish into both boats, both boats begin to sink. A haul. And Peter falls on his knees before Jesus because he knows he's not dealing with just any ordinary Joe here. And he confesses his sinfulness. And then we read a few verses ahead in verse 10 of Luke 5. Jesus said to Simon... Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Now, this is not a lesson about how to catch mass quantities of fish. It's a lesson to teach those of us followers of Christ to go into the deep places of God because that's where we will see the results for the kingdom. And Jesus says to us, as he did to Peter way back then, don't be afraid. In other words, don't be afraid to go into these deep places with God. There's nothing to fear. And when you do, you'll bring men from death to life into the kingdom of God. Let's pray before we uh, continue on. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for this incredible choir we just heard, and these kind of voices, Father, and the, the energy and the enthusiasm and the call, Lord, sent the Holy Ghost down on me, Father, and down on us, Father. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, and we pray, Holy Spirit, that you open up our hearts this morning to receive the word, that we would be not only hearers of the word, but doers. Haunt us with it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Amen. how was it that these first followers of Jesus that we all saw were with him for, for three years were such stumble bum, bums during that time? You know, think about what these apostles saw and but what they did. Arguing over who would be greatest in the kingdom, you know. Sometimes we're guilty of that. Oh, I'm pretty, I remember thinking back when I was about four years in the Lord. And I knew this lady who had been uh, with Jesus for 12 years. And I remember thinking, man, when I'm 12 years in the Lord, I'm going to be a whole lot better than she is. <laughs> and I found out. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> oh. 
Not really, no. <laughs> Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of God? The, then what he positions on each side of Jesus, you know, sit on each side of you in the kingdom. He asked them to, to watch and pray, remember? The night before he betrayed. I'm sure they did not understand what was about to happen. But what are they? What goes on? They all fell asleep. Man, talk about a bunch of losers. Anybody sleeping in here? Let me just <laughs> quickly. Uh, and then, of course, Peter denies Jesus, and the rest abandon him. Except John, we find at the, at the cross. But the rest were all in hiding. So, how did they do the amazing things we see in the Book of Acts? In Matthew's Gospel, chapter three, verse eleven. John the Baptist said this, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Fire. Jesus, when he was resurrected and spent 40 days with his uh, disciples, had said this, recorded in, in Acts uh, 1.8, he said to them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Did you ever think about when he says, you know, you're, it, they, were, they were in Jerusalem. So you're going to start there and then it's going to go out a little further into Samaria and, and, and it, it spreads. And that's the way it is in our lives. You do not know the impact when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you are a witness you have no idea how far that witness can go out. Because you speak to this one, this one speaks to another, this one speaks to another. Mm. So we began being, talking a bit about being baptized in the Holy Spirit last week. And understandably, if you're a little nervous or scared about this deep place, remember that Jesus says, fear not. And I say to you as the pastor of the Four Seasons Church... As we look into the baptism of the Holy Spirit and being full of the Holy Spirit, but that does not mean that our services will turn into some sort of spiritual Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> Acrobatics, dancing in the aisle, a mosh pit of tongue talkers, you know what I mean? <laughs> no. <laughs> there's power, but there's order. So we're going to look at some amazing blessings of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to look at uh, the cautions and the checks and balances a bit today. And I can say this, in the years since I came to Christ, 49 years ago, almost to the day, it was right around this time of year, sometime June or July, I remember, I remember exactly what went on, but I don't remember the day, you know. I hear a bird. I hear a bird. Oh. It might be a dove. Oh, it's oh, it's your hearing aid. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, that's a nice sound, though. It's like the Holy Spirit coming down as a dove. You know? So uh, it's almost 50 years I've known Jesus, and uh, about six months after I came to Christ, I moved out here. And uh, I went to that Assembly of God Church where I saw people raising their hands and heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in the years since, I've served in Southern Baptist churches, in the Foursquare uh, Gospel Denomination or Fellowship. Um, the last place I was was a Lutheran church, just all over the place, but especially in the, in the Pentecostal churches, in the Assemblies of God, in the Foursquare Gospel Denominations. I never saw anything wacko. Now, I did see there'd be times where people would, uh, there'd be a worship service and somebody would break into a tongue and everybody would go quiet and you just hear this very bold, dynamic uh, utterance that we didn't understand and then uh, a few moments after that person stopped, somebody across the room would come out with a very bold declaration uh, from God. And everything was very, very orderly. And... Uh, there wasn't jumping in the aisles or fits of emotionalism, and, and that can't go on in churches. I told Rich Ariola last week that we only have snake handling here twice a year now that we're assembly of God. Uh, so, <laughs> we're going to look at um, some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to share a few of my experiences. And this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 4. 
And Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to the Corinthian church and explained it this way. He said, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. It's common good. In other words, it's to benefit the church. To one, there is given the Spirit, uh, through the Spirit, the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And He gives to each one just as He determines. So, this won't be an exhaustive teaching today. You know, we could explore this uh, ad infinitum. But I'm going to touch on a few of these. The message of wisdom. There are times, and I think some people, uh, the Holy Spirit comes and gives a particular person a specific gift or gifts. Mm -hmm. And then I think also there are times when the Holy Spirit will just give us individually at a certain time a gift for the moment. With wisdom, um, I can think of times when, I, when I'm putting a message together and during the week, as I'm thinking about the scripture, as I'm thinking about what God wants me to say, uh, the, the Holy Spirit will just give me a certain, will remind me of something to, to bring forth to all of you. It's, it's, it's a word, it's, a, it's, a, it's the lips of the wise, you know, and that comes from the Holy Spirit. I think uh, back when we were leaving the library, I, I uh, kind of touched on this over the last couple of weeks, that we had 35 people. It cost us very little to uh, rent the room there, and then we were going to branch out and uh, lease something that was going to cost us thousands, but just really kind of a handful of people. And that was a, a struggle, you know, to think about that, to step out in that kind of faith. And I called this friend of mine, um, Danny Daniels, one another pastor, and I said, does, does this make sense to you, this step? And he, boom, it was like... Uh, Almost like a machine gun delivery. It was just ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. He gave me like seven reasons. Uh, and it was so of God. It was just wisdom. And it proved to be, it proved to bear out. And I was able to move forward uh, with that message or word. Some translations say the word of wisdom. Now the word of knowledge, the second gift he mentions. I've seen this in operation uh, more frequently. And, uh, or, and more in ways I can uh, be more specific about it. Uh, back in the 70s, when I was only 24 years old, I was attending a four-square church up in Henderson. And um, I was struggling because I was called to ministry. I knew I was called to ministry at 23, but I could not understand when I had this deep area of brokenness in uh, relationships and, and sexuality, uh, how this was going to come off. <laughs> you know, how can you take somebody with an issue that... I'm, in, I'm struggling with trying to figure out how to overcome and use me in ministry. So I'm up at this service, and they had Brian, I remember this name, Dick Mills, a guy who operated in the, uh, Diane remembers, and Brian made, uh, he operated in, in the gift of, of prophecy and words of knowledge, and so he preached for a while, and then he would uh, tell certain people to stand up, and he'd say, I have a word from God for you. And this was a Sunday night, and he had me stand up, and he said, I see a giant question mark over your head. I knew exactly what he was talking about, this wrestling. <clears throat> and I remember one of the scriptures he gave me. He gave me three or four scriptures, and one of them was Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Well, I did not know at that time those great and mighty things. And I remember leaving that meeting and walking the streets near uh, where we lived here in town and calling out to God, God, I don't understand this. And it was many years, 16 years really to be exact, later that I was in another Foursquare service and they had their worship time and then they broke, uh, uh, they, you know, like a time of greeting like we have here, 
And this man came up to me, and his name was Larry, and he was a Cajun man, and he had a major gift of prophecy. And he would always say, I know I'm ugly, but, and then he would give this prophecy. And I didn't think he was that ugly, you know. But we're just talking back and forth, and he said, hold on a minute. I see a giant question mark over your head. I had just had a major breakthrough in my life that week that, that was a launching into what I'm doing now. But, you know, so, so the Lord was showing me that he knew what was going on through a word of knowledge, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. But this is the word of knowledge, that giant question mark. I was uh, about 29. I'll tell one other story about the word of knowledge because I have a number of these. But I, when I was 29, I uh, had just moved back from doing shows in Chicago and moved into the Mark I building on East Desert Inn. And I uh, slept on the floor that night because my furniture hadn't arrived and woke up in the middle of the night with this excruciating lower back pain. And I thought it was because I was sleeping on the floor or I had been moving boxes, you know. So I began uh, seeing different chiropractors. And um, this went on weeks, weeks into months, into months. Every time there was a chance at a prayer at a church uh, rally to pray, I would go forward and be prayed for. Well, I suffered with this for a year and a half, and I found it was diagnosed as ankylosing spondylitis, which is arthritic, uh, arthritic condition that begins in men in their late 20s, which I was 29 at that time, early 30s. Uh, there's nothing they can do to heal it. It, it uh, is very painful in the morning. It loosens up during the day. It, the pain settles in again at night. It's crippling. There were days I was really crippled, and while I'm trying to do shows on stage, it limited. Like I remember, I could not bow at the waist like I'm doing now at 69 years old. So I'm, this goes on for a year and a half, and I uh, finished my show at the, at the Harris uh, back in those days, and uh, got home. It was uh, the show ended at two in the morning. I got home, showered, made myself a grilled cheese sandwich. That's how specific I am on the memory here. <laughs> And I have the, I'm watching television, eating my grilled cheese sandwich, and I'm getting ready for the movie that came on in Channel 5 uh, at 3 o'clock, because you know, we didn't have cable then. And the 700 Club is on, and I'm just watching the end of the 700 Club just for something to watch, and they begin to pray. And if you guys know the 700 Club, they usually pray, and they get words of knowledge. So there was Pat Robertson, Danuta Rilko back in those days, and Ben Kinslow. And I thought, wouldn't that be wonderful if one of them got a word of knowledge for me? But I'm thinking, what are the chances? Thousands of people are watching this thing, and they get, you know, four or five or six words of knowledge. So eating my grilled cheese sandwich, and all of a sudden, Ben Kinsler says, there's a young man in his late 20s, early 30s, being healed of an arthritic condition on the lower left side of his back. And I shouted at the TV said, no, it's the lower right side. <laughs> and he said, excuse me, it's the lower right side. Oh, oh, no. No. That tape, the show is taped. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks later, I, was, I had this townhouse. I was, got up, threw my clothes on, took the dog out on the front lawn. You know. So the dog's doing his thing. And I suddenly realized, I just ran down the stairs. I'd been running down the stairs for the last two weeks. I was healed. <laughs> but that word of knowledge, that you know <laughs> who did it. You know, it wasn't, well, it just went away. No, there's a man being healed through this word of knowledge. It confirms. My friend Rita, uh, they had a prayer group in here. Uh, Thursday nights for quite a while, her prayer group, and Diane knows, uh, it wasn't for the faint of heart. I mean, these people really prayed, and they did a lot of weird things, but they, you know, and it was, there was power. So she asked me one day, she said, darling, she was Dutch, darling, are you having any territorial issues at your church? I said, well, why? Because we were praying, and we saw this cat come through the wall of the Chinese restaurant and walk the parameter of the sanctuary and go back through the wall. And then it hit me. We had had construction going on here to move this wall back, put a lot of money uh, to do all kinds of stuff to get. And the guy uh, that owned the restaurant next door was watching this. The windows were open. He could see all this work going on. And about a week before Rita brought that up to me, 
uh, he, he, I, was, I saw him one day and he said, when you going to go that way? So he, could, he wanted to walk, knock the wall down and have us give up space. So that's what was going on. You know? And I thought to myself, are you crazy? Do you know we just put a whole lot of money to move? To move? Yeah. So yeah, the, the Lord can speak through the Holy Spirit to people. Tongues. No, I don't want to talk about that yet. Um, why do I add that down? So, yeah, okay. Oops. I think I skipped one of my pages of notes here that I want to... Maybe I threw it in here because I don't, I don't want you to miss this. It's really good. Yeah, here it is. I have to have these to stay on track. Otherwise, you know... So, oh, gift of faith. You know, all the steps we've taken uh, in this church, I really believe is that when God tells you to do something, he gives you that gift of faith to move forward because you are really going out into places you have, you have no idea how it's going to it's going to end up. It's like walking a tightrope without a net, you know? And I, and I believe uh, that's, that's a big part of what God does when we're moving in a certain direction that he gives us faith to move forward. When Stephanie and I got married, you know, when God spoke to my heart, and again, it was it was not an audible voice, but it was so strong that faith was put in me at, at 51 years old with a broken background to get married. And, and Stephanie, in the same way, she's married, she's engaged to Larry, another guy, not the prophet I talked about, uh, but somebody else. Uh, <laughs> and I really believe that God gave us a, a gift of faith to move forward. Because we had no guarantee of how things would, would, would work. But God gave us, it's like a, there's an inner confidence in that gift of faith. Uh, gifts of healing. Man, how many people remember Catherine Coleman? When you see, uh, amazing, you know, amazing, um, an amazing ministry. And the Holy Spirit would just work in a, in a powerful way. They would have their service, you do some teaching, uh, there you know, be worship. And then the Holy Spirit would begin to operate, and she would get words of knowledge, and she'd say there's a you know, healing going on, this kind of a healing, someone's being healed of a throat cancer or a hearing problem, and she would locate the area of the room. You know, where, how does that work? I, uh, she was based in our hometown of Pittsburgh. Well, I didn't live in Pittsburgh, but Pittsburgh was the closest big city. And uh, she also would uh, minister in Los Angeles, and right after I became a Christian, um, the Thanksgiving, uh, the Friday after Thanksgiving, way back in 1973, the lady who led me to the Lord and my sister and I, we all went down to Catherine Coleman's service. And this was a day after Thanksgiving. It's cold in Pittsburgh, you know, that time of year. It was just gray. Everything was gray. I mean, it was just like the sky came down gray out of the streets. The streets were gray. And yet when we got down there several hours before the service, there were people lining the streets to get into the service. And people on crutches, people in wheelchairs, people on uh, stretchers. So when we went in, um, there's so many people there that we could not get into the main auditorium when we went into an overflow room. So we could only hear the service, but you could slice the power in that place with a knife. And I'll never forget, she relayed a story of a man, because healings went on all throughout that service. And she related how a man had come into one of her services recently before that day who was a skeptic. A lot of people would come in who were skeptics, just, you know, what's this all about, this crazy stuff? And this man sat through the service and, uh, yeah, this is, this is weird, wacko stuff. Then he went home. And the next day he got up and took a shower. And when he came out of the shower, the bathroom mirror was steamed. And as the steam lifted, he noticed that there was no scar where he had had heart surgery. So on his next visit to the doctor, they ran tests where he had a pacemaker installed and the pacemaker was gone. <laughs> Don't mess with Catherine Coleman. <laughs> Don't mess with the Holy Spirit. And that's what she always was very careful to say. It's the Holy Spirit. Not me. It's the Holy Spirit. Miraculous powers, uh, I'll put this on hold because I haven't seen miraculous powers in operation. Maybe some of it's mixed in with gifts of healing. Uh, I think of like parting the Red Sea. I'm sure there are situations like that. Um, prophecy. Now, prophecy 
uh, has several different meanings. One is when they talk about people prophesying in a service back then, in that first century, it, it was bringing the word of God forth. What I'm doing right now is, is, a, is prophetic. It's prophecy. It's, it's declaring the word of God. It's teaching, you know, preaching. But then there's also the prophetic where this is what I see. God, is show, God shows somebody something going on similar to a word of knowledge. That same man, Dick Mills, at another service I attended, had me stand up and said, God's giving you favor. I was, again, in my 20s back then. He's giving you favor. And gave me a bunch of scriptures concerning that, and I found that to, to ring true. Every place I've gone and ministered, I had overwhelming favor uh, with the people in the congregation. And, and I love those people as well, but there was always uh, just uh, something, I don't know what it is, you know, but just favor. And another man by the name of Cruz Brown uh, that again came up to me years back and uh, I had left the ch a church service and I was in the parking lot, got in my car and just turned, was just turning my head to back up, you know how that is. And there was a guy that scared me, there was a guy standing right at my window. <laughs> yeah. And it was this guy in the church named Cruz Brown who was uh, very shy. Yeah, I, I never remember him doing anything except in the shadows. He, the last thing he wanted to do was be up in front of people and call attention to himself. But he had this gift of prophecy, and I rolled the window down, and he said, I have a word from the Lord for you. The Lord's showing me that you're being led into ministry. And at that time, I was still performing. He said, the Lord is telling me you don't have to be concerned about your career. I was still in the middle of that. And he said, and you'll never have to worry about finances. And in the 18 years of this ministry, we have never had to beg for money. Ever. We've not even had to do fundraising. Every time we have a need, the money's come in. You know, we, we, we were getting ready to uh, get new chairs for the church. That's the next step. And the money came in. Didn't even mention it. You know, never have to worry about finance. But see, you, I can go back to that. I remember that. And it was, it was God's finger touching me. It was prophetic. And when, when you receive, when somebody comes and gives you a, a true prophetic word from the Lord, it will speak to your heart. It won't be like, uh, now maybe once in a while it'll be, this is kind of crazy. But generally, the Lord is already doing something in you, and that's when you hear this expression, it witness to my spirit. That's what it did. I, I knew what this guy was saying was, was right. Let's see another little prophecy that I just think is wild. That same... Uh, Cajun prophet that would always begin by saying, I know I'm ugly, but a um, <laughs> friend of mine, uh, he, he was the associate minister, a young guy at the church, and he was getting married for the second time, and um, this Larry was at their wedding, or Doug, Doug Linderman and Susan, and Larry went to them on their wedding day and said, you are going to have twins, and they thought, he, they in that case, they thought he's out of his head, because... Doug had been married, his first marriage, he'd been married seven years, and he and his wife tried to have a baby, and it just didn't happen, and his wife had an affair with the downstairs neighbor, and she got pregnant. So he thought, problem is me. <laughs> and Susan only had one ovary. Those twins are like 31 years old now, and one of them is in ministry with her father, so, yeah. Distinguishing of spirits. I know what I know of this in my own life is I have times where people will come into the church or certain places, but sometimes they come in here, and every time I'm around them, there's just something I can't sort out. Like, like something's off here. You know, they can be really nice people. It's not a dislike. It's not a hate. You know, it's not not that. It's nothing. I'm, but I feel, hmm, I feel unsettled. There's something going on. You know. <laughs> Tongues and interpretation, and I know we're not, you know, doing an exhaustive study here. Tongues and interpretation, in 1 Corinthians 14, in the 37th verse beginning there, Paul again says, If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy, 
and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. With tongues, how many speak in tongues in here? Yeah. So when we speak in tongues, there's a, a, a my gift of tongues has always been a personal one where I, I will speak, talk to the Lord. I don't know what I'm saying. So sometimes it will create an emotional uh, thing in me as I'm rattling on and other times uh, not. And then there's a gift of tongues that's given for certain meetings where somebody, you know, where the, where the Holy Spirit just works in a very powerful way and you hear somebody give a tongue and again, it's always very bold, always boom, you know, and then someone will give an interpretation and, and it's a message from heaven, it's a message from God. Back in the 70s, I was uh, at this two-day seminar when the convention center was much smaller and the city was a lot smaller and it was a wonderful Christian uh, seminar. They brought men up from um, Melody Land back in those days, and so they had, uh, you know, they had the morning teaching, and and then they broke for lunch, and then we came back for lunch, and we had a worship time. And, and during the worship time, everybody was just praising the Lord and speaking in tongues, and you know, we were just going crazy. It was it was it was wonderful. And then the speaker got up, a man by the name of Walter Martin, some of you may know him, he wrote a, a, a book called Kingdom of the Cults, and he dealt with the, the, the falseness of Mormonism, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, and various cults that, that claim to be Christian, but really are way off from the Bible. So Walter Martin stepped up as we're just finishing all this worship time, and he said, you are out of order. What? That kind of broke the good time, you know. And then he directed us to 1 Corinthians 14, 22. And it says this, Tongues then are a sign not for believers, but, unbel but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. So, if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some do not understand, or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? <laughs> But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, and that is declaring the word of God, mm -hmm. um, will he not be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all, and the secrets of his heart will be laid bare, so he will fall down and worship God, he's claiming God is really among you. So even though I speak in tongues, and a number of you others do, I don't want, I don't think it's a fitting thing for a morning service. Now if we're between music, if you're if we're praising God and you're saying hallelujah and these sort of things and you quietly just go into a little bit of a tongue, you know, without making a show of it, that can be appropriate. But, you know, now when we have our prayer meeting Saturday morning, we rarely, anybody rarely speaks in tongues, but you're welcome to there because it's a closed group of people. And it may even, uh, you know, some people will not understand it. And again, if you are praying in tongues, you, in that kind of a situation, you have to be consider it because none of us can understand it you know and what it's wonderful that you're speaking to the lord but the rest of us when we're coming corporately can't and the apostle paul again said this in first corinthians 14 beginning in the 18th verse he said i thank god that i speak in tongues more than all of you but in the church i would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than ten thousand words in a tongue how much uh, how clear is that you know <laughs> So let's remember that it's Jesus who wants us baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it's Jesus himself who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives us power to live a triumphal, triumphant life. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to bless the church. And certainly we want blessing in the church. So other gifts are listed in 1 Corinthians 12. Other giftings like uh, some are apostles. Some are, are pastors, you know, various uh, stations. Uh, so there are other things we could talk about this morning, but we won't. But often what causes people to shy away from launching out into the deep with spiritual things is seeing these gifts abused or used in a manner that's putting on a show, you know. And we've all seen televangelists that kind of wear like a certain kind of uniform, you know, <laughs> or costume. <laughs> and then they seem to just push people over, you know. Maybe I'm the only one that saw that, but, <laughs> you know. One of my pastors, Bud Higginbotham, he, he would have a man that used to 
every week have a message, you know, uh, in the in the worship time, and he'd go into a tongue, and then he he give this uh, word from the then he'd interpret it, you know. So one day Bud was out behind the church before a church service, and he saw the guy rehearsing what what he was going to declare from the Lord, you know. <laughs> So he stopped that, you know. <laughs> and if you read through Acts, you know, you, you'll see the Holy Spirit coming on people. And you'll see people speaking in tongues all throughout the book of Acts. But you won't see them doing anything weird, really. You know, it's supernatural. We'll see things that are supernatural. Yeah. Yeah. If, you know, when you see that, when you see a, a lame man healed, you know, and you know, walking and leaping, praising God, uh, you know, that's supernatural. But, but it's not weird, if you know what I mean. It's real. It's real. When God's doing something, it's real. I've known times of spiritual ecstasy. And I've had some exhilarating times in the Lord. I've had amazing answers to prayer from time to time. But most of my life in Christ has been very subdued, you know. Many, many days have just been tedious and monotonous. And it's called discipline. You know, Rick was talking about how he's not a Bible reader I mean, he's been reading now through the Bible and it's you know it's not a natural thing well it's not for any of us discipline is not natural for any of us you know uh, clean the garage uh, you know clean that closet read the Bible pray many times I do not feel like praying I pray because I'm disciplined I exercise physically but not because at 69 I can't wait to get to planet fitness it's because it's discipline, and I know it's good for me. So it's, there's a lot of tedium in the Christian life. And 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We walk by faith and not by sight. If we're looking for experience to keep us on track with the Lord, you're not, it's not going to happen. And uh, yeah, Sheila, had, came, Sheila came in with that same thing this morning. It says, We walk by faith and not by sight. And I like that translation, we walk, because you know, life is a walk. It's not a skip or a jump most of the time. It's, it's a walk. It's a minute to minute and hour to hour and day by day walk with the Lord. And uh, the NIV says we live by faith. We do. We live by faith and not by sight. And, and there are dramatic things that happen. And if you want to read a dr dramatic experience in the Lord, read 1 Kings 18. Where you see Elijah on Mount Carmel facing the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah. These were God, a god and goddess of fertility. A lot of sexuality involved in, in the worship. And he stands on that mountain and says to the people of Israel, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And then he has this confrontation with the prophets over calling out for fire to come down from heaven. And, and the 850 prophets of these false gods pray all day, cut themselves, go into conniptions, nothing happens. Elijah speaks a few words and fire <laughs> comes down from heaven. That's dramatic. Oh, I love that chapter. But the very next chapter, chapter 19, we read this. He's, he's run away because uh, Jezebel is chasing him, wants his death. And we read in 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13, God says this, Go forth and stand before the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in the cave and behold there came a voice unto him and it said what doest thou here Elijah? If you build it they will come. <laughs> it's like that. It really is. It's, it's not a big you know, most of the time, that's the way the Lord is going to speak to us in that still, small voice. One other thing before we close. The disciple Thomas had seen incredible things. Imagine. 
Imagine walking, sleeping, eating for three solid years with Jesus, what he heard. Imagine what he saw. But when Jesus was resurrected, he wasn't there with that group, the other 11, when they appeared. And we all know that he said in John 20, 25, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. And then a week later, the resurrected Christ appears to him. And he tells him, put, put your, go ahead, touch me. Put your fingers where you wanted to put your fingers. And then we read this in John 20, 29. And Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So what I'm saying this morning is we go into the deep places with the Lord. We go into the deep places with the Holy Spirit. And we will see amazing things, but we don't live for those amazing things to happen. And, and we do walk by faith. So there's a balance between both of these situations. Ephesians 5.18 says this, Be filled, it's command, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 19, 1 and 2, it says this, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus where he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So he's saying to these people, they believed in Jesus. But he's asking them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit? There's a second event, a second baptism. Yeah, when you come to Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. That's what gives us that confidence. We, we, we believe. But then there's a yielding that comes when we... It's not just the Holy Spirit coming on us. It's, it's giving ourselves wholeheartedly to the Lord. And then we read in Acts 19, 6, and we'll close with this. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. I'm not going to pray today for you, but sometime we, we will pray for the Holy Spirit. For those who say, I, I want to be sure I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. I want the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're told to earnestly desire the greater gifts. But that's another time. But I would encourage you to do this. Begin to seek the things of the Holy Spirit. Go home in your prayer closets. And it, maybe you can do like me years back. Where, where I did not understand this baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I kept seeking it, kept asking God, baptize me in the Holy Spirit. I read things about the Holy Spirit. And then eventually, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it did, doesn't end there. We, we keep yielding ourselves again and again for the Holy Spirit to be in us, to be full of the Holy Spirit, to operate in that power. Let's close in prayer. God Almighty, how amazing it is when we look at the moon and the stars, when we look at creation, just like the psalmist to say when we consider these things, we consider the worlds within worlds and worlds outside of worlds and the countless stars and we say, what, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And yet you are, Lord. You want us to know you, Lord. You want us to walk with you the same way Adam and Eve walked with you in the cool of the day in that sinless garden. You sent Jesus to be a bridge for us. And so we are thankful, Lord, that we can know you. Even though, as the Apostle Paul said, it's through a glass darkly. But what we see, God, we makes us hunger for more of you. And we want the most in you, Lord. We don't want a halfway life in you. We don't want a mediocre life in you. We want our total being to be enveloped in you and in your Holy Spirit. And in this brief time that we're on this planet, we want to reflect you. And we want to see great things, Lord, occur for your glory and your goodness to influence other lives through the power of walking and living 
in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we've been together. We thank you for each man in this place, Lord, how important man is, how important fathers are. I pray a blessing on those men who actually raise their children who are fathers in this room. And for those of us, Lord, that don't have physical children, but we influence other people, I pray a blessing on all of us as well. We thank you for this time together. And I pray, Lord, as we go to our homes today and throughout this week, that you keep our hearts beating in tune with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.